Has your brain ever wondered what the parts of the brain are and what are their functions? Well, that's basically what we're gonna talk about in this video. So what you're looking at is a section of your brain. And to make sense of this, let's say you could see someone's brain from the top. Then you would be able to see the two hemispheres like this. Don't worry, this is not a brain, this is just a walnut. It looks very similar to the brain. But let's say these are two hemispheres. Now, imagine you cut this walnut and then you look at the inside side of this one. Then you will see something like this, right? The inner side of one of the halves. Well, that's basically what we're looking at. It's the inner side of one of the hemispheres, okay? So let's get rid of that and look at the different parts. We can broadly divide our brain into three parts. The forebrain, which is this big yellow section. The midbrain, which is this tiny pink section, and the hindbrain, or the lower brain, which is this blue section. Usually when we say humans have big brain, we're basically talking about this forebrain section, okay? And then the midbrain is actually the beginning part of the brain stem. Brain stem is, is, brain stem is on top of which the forebrain sits. The brain stem connects the forebrain to the spinal cord. This continues as the spinal cord. So the beginning section of that brain stem is what we call as the midbrain. And then the later section of the brain stem is a part of the hindbrain, right? This is the hindbrain. And the hindbrain also consists of this section. You know, this itself looks like a mini brain all by itself, but that and the remaining portion of that brain stem is basically what we call the hindbrain. Okay, so what are the functions of them? Before we get into the details, to get a broad sense of what these parts do, we can think that the forebrain is responsible for all the voluntary functions, and the midbrain and the hindbrain together are responsible for all the involuntary functions. So when I say voluntary, think about all the actions that you carry out consciously by thinking about them, like to take a walk, or maybe to talk to someone, or decide to watch this video about brains. So all of that is from your forebrain. And of course, we'll talk more details about that in a second. And when I say involuntary functions, there are some functions that are happening in your body which are not in control, what, which you're not in control of. For example, your heart beating, or maybe your digestion, you're not in control of those, right? So those are mostly taken care by your midbrain and the hindbrain. So how do we remember which part does which? Well, the way I like to think about it is I remember that you know, what makes humans special is their big brain, big forebrain. And I remember that we have this amazing intellectual ability, right? Our intelligence. So forebrain gives us our intelligence. So it's because of that I can do all my thinking and all my decisions and also I can walk and talk because of this. So that's how I basically remember forebrain controls voluntary actions. With this in mind, let's look at the functions and the parts in a little bit more detail. So let's zoom out a little bit and I've made some space so that we can write more parts. So let's start with the forebrain. If you look at the forebrain, you can again kind of see two sections of it. The outer section, which contains a lot of folds, and the inner section. Let me shade that inner section a little bit darker so we can identify that. So the outer section, right, this big giant outer section, it's called, it's called, let me call that, it's called the cerebrum, cerebrum, sorry the cerebrum. This whole outer section, which I have colored with light yellow, is the cerebrum. And we're not gonna look at further parts of that, okay? So that's the outer section for us. If you look at the inner section, we're gonna look at three parts of the inner section, okay? One part, which is over here. So let me put an arrow mark like this. Then one part, which is a little below that, I'm gonna write over here somewhere, okay, wait a second. Yeah, let me write that over here. And this small thing that you can see, that one, these are the three parts that we need to remember, at least for our syllabus, okay? So this one, you know what we call that? That is called the thalamus. Let me use this color, okay. It's called the thalamus. And these are all Greek names, okay, so it will not make sense to us. But I looked up, 
Thalamus kind of means an inner portion or inner region. And it's basically what this is, right? It's the inner region of our forebrain. So the, com the, the, the part that comes below that is called hypothalamus. So the next part is hypothalamus. And the hypo kind of means lower, so it's the lower part of the thalamus, hypothalamus. And this last part, which we'll be interested in, this one, this small thing that you can see over here, that is called the pituitary gland. Pituitary gland. Right, this part over here, okay? So these are the four parts of our forebrain. So these are the only parts that we'll concentrate on, so let me just put them together. So this is your forebrain parts. All right, so what do they do? What are their functions? We, we don't have to look at the individual functions, we don't have to do that, but the forebrain as a whole, what does it do? Well, one of the things, like we already said voluntary functions, but again, let's dig a little deeper. What does it do? Well, one of the things that you can think of is thinking, right? And when I say thinking, I'm including a lot of things over here because there's not much space. Thinking, your learning ability, your speech, language, all of that, all of that comes from your forebrain. But what else? To think about what else your forebrain can do, take a look at this picture. The reason you are able to see this is because of your forebrain. You may be wondering, wait, it's my eyes, right? It's eyes, but the eyes send the signal to the brain and it's your forebrain that does the processing and that's why you can see it. Similarly, you can hear me right now because of your forebrain. All the five senses, you can sense them because of your forebrain. And so one important function of your forebrain is sensing. Let me just write that as sensing. Okay, what else? Well, you identified this picture, right? It's a puppy. Did you confuse it with something like maybe a donkey or tiger? No. The reason you can even remember it's a puppy is because of your memory, because you know what puppies look like and you can associate with it. So that also comes from your forebrain. Memory, learning, all of that comes from your forebrain. Now when you looked at this puppy, some kind of emotion came in, right? Like you may have felt, oh, what a cute puppy. You may have felt happy looking at it. Maybe if I showed you some different picture, maybe if I showed you some scary picture, you'd, you'd experience fear, right? So all the emotions, they too come from your forebrain. All your emotions, including love. That's all right, love does not come from the heart, it comes from your forebrain. In fact, fun story, the other day my wife asked me, hey, how much do you love me? I said, I love you with all my forebrain. Yeah, she hasn't spoken to me since, but it was worth it. All right, now besides these, there are also other things that the forebrain does. Some of the feelings that you get, like for example, the feeling of hunger, the feeling of being sleepy, thirst, or maybe, you know, after you have finished a meal, the feeling of fullness, all of that also comes from your forebrain. Actually, that comes from this part of the forebrain, but we don't have to remember all those things. So these are some of the functions of your forebrain. So what's next? We're not gonna look at the parts of the midbrain, it's a tiny section, we'll not look at its parts. So let's jump directly to the hindbrain. If you look at this brain stem over here, the bluer section, you can actually see two distinct regions over there. So one region, one lump over here, and one more here, right? So this one, this one, let me use a different color. All right, so this one over here, it's called Pons. That's the name given to it, Pons. Again, I know, little weird name. Uh, it's Latin, again, it means bridge. It's kind of like bridging between the middle brain and this bottom part. That brings us to this bottom part, which is pretty important for us. The bottom one is called, let me write that down over here, it's called medulla, medulla oblongata. Okay, we're gonna look at its functions separately. And then you can look at this big region. Let's make it dark so we can see that. So this region, which kind of looks like a brain on its own, is called cerebellum. Do not confuse that with cerebrum. Cerebrum is the biggest part of our brain. 
cerebellum, that's the name given to this. So these three regions, these three regions are going to be the part of our hindbrain. So these are hindbrain. And since we're not gonna look at the parts of the midbrain, this is it, this is all the parts that we need to remember. So again, what are the functions of the hindbrain? We already saw it's involuntary, but let's look at the individual one. Let's look at medulla oblongata and the cerebellum. These two are important for us. So what does the medulla oblongata do? Well, again, it controls most of the life-giving involuntary processes. Okay, so um, we'll say life-giving involuntary processes. In, I'll just write involve, okay? Involuntary processes. That means these are the most essential for life, like your heart beating, your breathing, digestion, all of those essential things are taken care of by your medulla oblongata. Along with that, it also controls some of your reflexes. Now if you've studied about reflexes before, you may be wondering, hey, isn't that controlled by your, well, by your spinal cord? Yes, some of them are controlled by the spinal cord, but some of the reflexes, like your sneezing, coughing, those are controlled by your medulla oblongata, all right? The idea is the reflexes are not controlled by your thinking part of the brain. None of the reflexes are controlled by the forebrain. That's why they're even called reflexes. But the medulla does control some of your reflexes as well. So these are the two major functions of the medulla. Okay, what about the cerebellum? It's getting a little crowded, I hope you can see them apart, so again, I'm gonna put some division over here. Anyways, so what does cerebellum do? Well, cerebellum also has some involuntary function, but it's a little different. One of its function is to maintain balance. Balance. Now what I mean by this is, if you wanna do even the simplest of the simplest tasks, like walking, or maybe holding a cup, these things require careful calculation, coordination, you, know, you have to think about where the gravity is and all of those stuff. Right, if you try to build a robot, it's then you actually see how complicated those things are. But we do it with ease. That's because of our cerebellum, because it is the one that maintains balance. And along with that, another major function is motor memory. Motor memory, what's that? Well, think of uh, riding a bicycle. With the first time when you were trying to learn the bicycle, you were using a lot of your forebrain, you were learning. You were learning to get balance, you were learning how the pedal works, you were learning maybe how to do the tring tring and everything, you, all those things you're learning. But once you learn that, once you've done enough practice, now when you want to ride your bicycle, you don't even think about it. We say it's, it has become our second nature, right? All of things happen automatically. How? It's the cerebellum. It's the, that's what we call as motor memory. Another example could be, let's say when you're typing on a keyboard, if you have enough enough practice, you don't have to look down anymore. You don't have to worry about which keys are where. It just automatically happens. Motor memory. So all those things are controlled by the cerebellum. And you know how I can remember this? I remember this uh, by remembering that, you know, when people drink alcohol, it's their cerebellum that gets affected. Now think about it. If your cerebellum gets affected, your balance gets affected. And that's why people who are intoxicated, they can't balance themselves. They will be walking funny and everything. They may no longer be in a position to ride a bicycle. This is actually one of the reasons why we say don't drink and drive, because your motor memory gets affected. So even the most basic things that initially, uh, usually we think it's easy for us to do, like while driving, that gets affected. All right, so that's how I remember uh, the functions of the cerebellum. All right, so finally you may be wondering, what about the midbrain? So this is our midbrain, right? We're not gonna look at the parts of the midbrain. Midbrain also controls some of the involuntary functions. For example, when you shine light in your eyes, your pupils become smaller. That is controlled by your midbrain. So the midbrain also controls some of your involuntary functions, but we're not gonna look at that. And this is pretty much it for us. Now since this screen itself contains the entire summary, why don't you try pausing the video and then revise and then see if you can recall all the parts and the functions without looking. <laughs> ah! In the second one, look at that black pupil at the at the center. See what happens to it as I shine light. Okay. <laughs> and over here, my leg is coming up automatically. I'm not doing this on purpose. The moment I hit it, the leg comes up automatically. 
So the question is, what did you find common in all the four videos? Well, besides the fact that I'm torturing myself, at least mildly, one thing common you can find is that in all four cases, there is a stimulus. What's a stimulus you ask? Stimulus is some kind of a change in the environment of a body. For example, over here, the temperature of the finger changes. That's a stimulus. Over here, the light, the amount of light entering my eye changes. Stimulus. Here, before I sneezed, I sniffed something. So the environment inside my nose changed. Stimulus. And over here, I'm hitting myself somewhere in, uh, at, at the knee. So the pressure changed. Again, a stimulus. Okay. What else is common? Well, I am responding to that stimulus in all the four cases. Over here, I move my hand away. Here, my pupils become smaller. Over here, I sneeze, trying to get that, you know, get something out. And over here, my leg raises. So there's a response to the stimulus. Great. There's one more thing that's common in all the four. What's that? The thing is, these responses are all involuntary. Meaning, I am not consciously deciding to do that. It's happening automatically, right? So it's an involuntary response to a stimulus. That, my dear friend, is what we call a reflex action. So let's write that down. What's a reflex action? Reflex action. What is that? Well, it's, it's an involuntary response. In voluntary response to a stimulus. Now what's so interesting about reflex actions is that it's different than other involuntary processes like your heart beating and your breathing or maybe digestion. Those are also involuntary processes. But over here, it requires a stimulus. Only then the reflex action happens. That's what's different over here. So I guess the question is, how does this work? I mean, how can you respond to something without being conscious about it, without even thinking about it? I mean, look at these cases. I'm not even thinking about it and it's just happening. So how does it work? Well, turns out some of the reflex actions are more complicated than the others. So we will only study the one that is most commonly found in our body, okay? And so it turns out that the mechanism of this one, the mechanism of this reflex action is the most common. So let's look at this one in detail. So here is my arm. I have shown the bicep muscle over here because that will be important for us. So in such reflex action, it turns out that there are only three neurons involved. Only three cells are involved and it involves our spinal cord. So let me just draw that as well. So this is a section of the spinal cord. If I were to show you a little bit more of my spinal cord, here it is, this is the down part. So you can kind of see, right, what, this, what I mean by a section. And these are the nerves that are coming out, the bundle of nerves that are coming out from the spinal cord, okay? So let's see what happens. So the moment the temperature of my finger increases, that is detected by a neuron which is present over here. That neuron converts that heat into electrical signal. And that electrical is signal is sent to the spinal cord. So this is a neuron. And if you're wondering why am I looping it over here, I'll tell you in a second. But anyways, this single neuron, and if you're wondering, are can a cell be this long? The answer is yes, Neural, neurons are the longest cells in our body. Neurons can be really, really long, okay? So that single neuron takes that electrical signal and sends it to the spinal cord. What happens after that? Well, then that signal is taken by another neuron. So the signal goes to another neuron over here, another neuron over here, and then that signal goes to the brain. The neuron sends that signal to the brain. So it's going like this, goes this way, and then from here, that signal goes to the brain, okay? And this is what happens all the time. So there's nothing different over here. But what's different in reflex action, what happens next is that it will not wait for the brain to give command, okay? Usually, once the signal is sent to the brain, the brain is the one that 
processes the signal, then decides what to do. But in reflex action, that in this reflex action at least, that's not what happens. What happens is it does not wait for the brain to give the command. The signal from this neuron is immediately sent to yet another neuron. And that's what's, that's what's different over here. It's sent to yet another neuron, which sends that signal directly to my bicep muscle in this case. It sends it directly to that bicep muscle. So the electricity gets directly sent to the bicep. The bicep contracts, pulling my, you know, my hand. And as a result, my hand moves away from the fire. And so the speciality of the reflex action is that it does not wait for your brain to process that information and gain, then to give you command. It immediately redirects it to the muscle and the reflex action is carried out. And this is why even without thinking about it, even if you're not thinking about it, even if this happens accidentally, automatically the hand moves away. That's the speciality of reflex action. Okay, so the obvious question might be, why is this happening? Why are we not waiting for the brain to process the information and then give the command? Can you think about this? I want you to pause the video and think about why the information is directly sent to the muscle. Why, not, why aren't we waiting for the brain? Can you answer that? Pause the video and think about it. Well, I'm pretty sure you guessed it. If we had to wait for the brain to think about it and then decide what to do, in that time, the damage would have already been done, right? Because this is a dangerous situation for our survival, we need immediate action. And in such cases, it does not wait for your brain. That's the speciality of this reflex action. And so you see, since reflex actions are super important for our survival, we still have them, even though we have a complex brain. In fact, would you be surprised if I told you that reflex actions were first evolved before a complex brain, right? Before complex intelligence evolved, reflex actions evolved first because they are the ones that will ensure your survival. So the last thing to do is just go ahead and label this diagram and I'll also tell you a couple of things to remember while drawing this. So this big neuron that senses the stimulus, we call it, no surprise, the sensory neuron. So this is called the sensory neuron. And this neuron that acts on the muscle and makes it contract and makes your hand move, this one is called the motor neuron. Motor neuron. It's called so because it's causing motion. It's because of this neuron, motion is happening. That's why it's called motor neuron. And the neuron that transfers the information from the sensory neuron to the motor neuron in the, in the spinal cord, this one is called, this one is called the relay neuron. Relay means transfer of information over here. So this is called the relay neuron. And of course, this is our spinal cord. This is our spinal cord. And lastly, this entire pathway, which consists of sensory neuron, the relay neuron, and the motor neuron, that entire pathway is also given a name. It's called the reflex arc. Reflex arc, okay? So in our example, the reflex arc consists of one sensory neuron, one relay neuron, and one motor neuron. Of course, some other reflex arcs might have more neurons in them. Some reflex arcs can have fewer neurons in them, that's right. For example, that knee reflex that we saw, it turns out it only has sensory and motor. It does not contain relay. So some reflex arcs can have only two neurons, but the most common ones will have three neurons in them. Okay, now a couple of things to remember while drawing this. First of all, why do I draw a loop over here in the sensory neuron? Well, that's because most of the time when we see a neuron, this is the picture that comes to our head, right? But neurons don't have to look like this. Neurons can have a variety of shapes. And one of the shapes that neurons can have is like this. Neurons can also look like this. And sensory neurons do look like this. All sensory neurons look like this. And so this thing that I've drawn, this loop I've drawn is actually the body of the neuron over here, all right? That's why sensory neurons are drawn that way. So keep that in mind. So let me get rid of that. And the second thing you may want to remember is that sensory neurons always go to the backside of our spinal cord. So this is the backside. 
and the motor neurons will always come out of the front side of the spinal cord. You, just something to remember while drawing the diagram. That's it. Time to now recall, recall what we just learned. So can you define what reflex action is? What is a reflex arc? Can you tell what sensory neurons, relay neurons, which are also called interneurons, by the way, I forgot to mention that, and motor neurons, what do they do? And finally, can you try drawing the entire reflex arc drawing? See, if you try to recall this now, you will be able to remember this much longer. Okay, so please try and recall. And of course, if you are stuck anywhere, you can always go back and rewatch the video.